All right, we're recording. Thanks for joining me from far across the uh, other side of the house. Yep, um, I'm ready to go. Testing the new setup. We'll see how it goes. Yep. I don't know, so I figured we could um, have a little bonus episode talking about Ionia since it just came out um, yesterday. Well, well pre-sale. Pre-sale, correct. Yeah, it's coming out sometime in April. That's exciting. Yeah, it, it, it developed very, very quickly. Um, yeah, a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, a couple of weeks. Um, I'm always a, a, a resistor. Back <laughs> over, a dec- over a decade ago, well <laughs> over, what's that? I said, you don't say. Um, over a decade ago, I used to get uh, um, a, a regular request from um, a label called Handmade Birds about wanting to put out cold on vinyl. And I, I constantly said, no, no, no. And then when I finally agreed to do it, it sort of um, became the catalyst for our career getting a jump start. Um, and likewise, Roberto from Avant Garde Music had... Um, been approaching me for years about doing I own your start corner on vinyl and of course I always said no and um, but a, a couple of years ago I made the decision that if he asked me again I would say yes and then he just didn't ask me again and out of the blue he asked me and I said sure and from that point into this point literally has only been a couple of weeks and it's yeah, been a world, three weeks it's been a whirlwind few weeks and I have to say this these last couple of days have been absolutely nuts here. I didn't, I never realized how much, how, how important Lycia was not only in Europe, but in aspects of the metal scene. And it's, it's humbling. Um, I was emailing John Fair of Lycia and I told him that so many, it's so much is happening and it's so exciting, but it's also stressful because it just feels almost like a tidal wave. You know, I've spent years and years sort of feeling that Lycia had passed its prime and no one really cared anymore. And then out of the blue, you know, things picked up the last few years, but these last few days, it's it's been unreal. I mean, I've gotten to the point where I almost just stay away from my phone because it's just nonstop messages and post and um it's been exciting i just hope that um everyone's happy they did a, a great job with the uh, what you know it's it's at the plant now but just from the way it looks like it's going to be it's just going to be a knockout i'm i'm, I'm yeah, it's really very excited yeah i can't wait to see it and um play it yeah yeah cool. and i never it's funny because me and you have talked about this quite a bit. Ionia is such a strange album for me because it was such a uh, an album that I had to just wheel and deal with to get it out because there was such turmoil in the band from you know John leaving just prior to Project offering um, us the deal back in uh, 1990. John got an opportunity to go out and tour with a a band that was on a major label and he he went and toured the United States and Japan. I, I don't think his intention was to leave Lycia, but literally a week or so after he left, the project deal came down and it was something that appeared to be imminent. Uh, you know, this was prior to the, the internet day. I couldn't just get on and message him and say, hey man, we got a record deal, come on back. He, I had no idea where, where he was or really how to get a hold of him. And so, you know, I proceeded to work on the album with um, a guy that was in the fringe of the band, Will Welsh. And um, on, uh, per our initial discussion, we were going to replicate the songs that John and I had recorded and demoed and the, uh, and the songs that got us the deal with Project. And um, that lasted probably a grand total of a day or two and will came in with um 
a game plan that pretty much threw me off my game, which was, I don't want to replicate his parts. I don't want to play any of his songs. I, I, I don't want to have anything to do with Lycia's past. I think we should reboot the band and move forward. And for, I have no idea why I agreed to it. I should have just said, I'm going to go on and try to figure another way. But I, I think at the time I was pretty dependent on working with other, other musicians. I didn't really have the confidence in myself to move forward. So I agreed. We wrote a couple really good songs with XK yeah, Decade to Pod. And we wrote Byzantine. And I thought, well, maybe this is something that could work because I liked both those songs, even though it was a real definite change in direction. And after that, I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, it seemed from that point on that the songwriting sort of stalled and um, some of the new songs that we wrote and seemed to be just imitations of the songs we had already wrote. And then since that wasn't work, and then we started to redo some songs that I had wrote, like um, um, Distant Eastern Glare and Ionia. And we literally, and Desert. And if you go to the Lycia uh, SoundCloud pages, you can hear some of those early versions, but he even nixed working on those versions, which were more towards my original vision. He really wanted to have much more creative input. And I, I still remember we did this version of Distant Eastern Glare in the style of Byzantine. And it was just, I wasn't into it. And when we finally decided on the song listing for what our first project album was going to be, and we were going to call it Byzantine, I wasn't into it. He wasn't into it. It was a compromise. And then when we tried to mix it, it was just, I, I, I think it was probably maybe 20 minutes into the mix session and we, and I was just like, this is done. I, I want nothing to do with this. And I think he felt the same way. And the irony was is that me, Will, and his girlfriend were living in this, this old dilapidated house over in Tempe, which he referred to as the punk rock house. And it was so punk rock that when, the, when we first moved in, the, the gas guy came to turn the gas on. And he says, I'm not turning the gas on. This house is going to explode. So we lived there for like nine months with no hot water and it was just it was it was a piece of shit man <laughs> this house was dilapidated but um we all lived there and that's where we started tracking byzantine and actually did the whole byzantine album and um when we were doing that mixing session it was apparent it wasn't going to work and i remember telling will we're going to have to just record from scratch we're going to have to start from scratch and and then i just never saw him we lived in the same house. I'd go to my job, I'd come home. And I'd, there's no, you know, under the premise that we were gonna record. And mm -hmm. I'd ask his girlfriend, where's Will? She's like, I don't know. He went out skating with his buddies. He said he was gonna be back here to record with you. But I'd wait up until 10, 11 o'clock at night to record and he would never show up. And finally, after a couple of weeks of that, I was really feeling pressure because the deal with Project we had an April 1991 deadline. I pro Sam probably doesn't remember this, but I, I remember it. And Will and I had started working, I think in December of 1990 on the album and tracked it from December to, you know, February to March or whatever. And that's when we realized it wasn't working. So here it was right around the time that the album was due and Will wasn't showing up. And I, I really had this sensation that my record, the record deal that we had gotten, that Lycia had gotten, was going to be gone. Sam wasn't yeah. really happy with the nonstop delays, the right. change of plans. And I don't blame him. I right. mean, I mean he was weird. interested in, in the songs that John and I wrote that were guitar based and atmospheric and right. distorted. And now suddenly, me and Will are doing this sort of slow motion. I don't, I, 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 I feel uncomfortable calling it industrial, but you know, if you listen to like Byzantine and sort of that bump, yeah. bump, 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 it, it sort of had a, a industrial. Like yeah. Sound to it. yeah. And also sort of had a, a sort of a 
central European sound to it, you know, with um, some of the background horns and everything. Yeah, that yeah, were. Yeah. And I was, I was just flailing at the time, you know, I was working a day job out in the sun here in Arizona, 11 hours outside in the sun. And I'd come home and, you know, do recording sessions. I mean, we were doing recording sessions and now here we were at the point where we needed to get the album done. Right. And he just was a wall. And I still remember this so clearly. And this house was so dilapidated that there were like the walls were separating. So the room I was in was what? adjacent to, yeah, there was like little holes. Yeah. In the, I mean, yeah, the house was on the verge of falling apart. It was, I mean, it like was a shanty. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was bad. So I was laying in bed one morning and I could hear Will and his girlfriend talking in the other room. And I heard them talk about how they were going to move. And I heard um, Will's girlfriend say, well, what about, what about Mike? First of all, let's back up a little bit. I wasn't even on the lease. I was subletting from them. Right. But to make a long story short, they were just going to move out on me. And I was just going to show home, show up from work one day and they were just going to be gone. And I was going to be in some house that, you know, you don't have any ownership of. No. So yeah, I so heard that. that <laughs> and um, I heard some other things that I'm not going to repeat, which was along the lines of screw Mike, right. who cares about him. Now, take into account, this was the whole time that I was showing up back from work wanting to do these recording sessions and he was AWOL. So I had physically seen him for probably a month right. when we were supposed to be recording, but I heard him talking and they were going to just move out. So I just, I was just like, I had no, I wanted nothing to do with that. So I went out that day. It was my day off from work and I went out and found an apartment and I came home that night and said, I'm moving and I'm moving in a couple of days. And they were shocked and they were angry. They didn't realize they had overheard what they had said. So and so I left, I left and I moved to this small little um, studio apartment over in West Mesa um, in, a, in a newer apartment building, but this place couldn't be more Spartan. I had one window that faced to the North and all I could see was the stucco side of a building. I never got any sunlight in there, but I couldn't even open my window because there was a walkway to the adjacent apartment and the the person that lived next door to me for some strange reason decided that it was great to hang out on this walkway as opposed to his actual balcony and he also thought it was great to do woodworking up in front of my window at like two in the morning so i literally just hold myself up in this apartment and with the sole focus of I don't want to lose this recording contract. I had been um, doing music since 1981 and it was now uh, 1991. I had been doing music for 10 years. I really was functioning in a Phoenix in Tempe, Arizona scene that had zero appreciation for what I brought in minus a handful of musicians that seemed to like working with me, like John Fair and Michael Irwin early on and Eric Sorlman and uh, a few other people. Uh, for the most part, um, what I was doing was completely um, disregarded in the Phoenix scene. I always joke around about my career in the 80s. It was I was playing in a bunch of different bands and the height of our success was being the opening band on a Tuesday night. Right which meant you were literally playing while the other bands were loading their equipment and the other bands, friends were showing up and we'd have three or four friends standing out there. It was never any kind of legitimate success. Very early days we played in front of some big crowds, but it was just because Michael Irwin was such a great promoter. He got us on a lot of bills, but later on, you know, Needless to say, after 10 years, I thought, you know, if, if, if I can't deliver on this album, it's over. Yeah. Done. And so I just this had this. This is after you, your failed attempt to move to San Francisco, correct? 
That's this is after it. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's um, that was a, a few years previous. Okay. So I had this little studio apartment. I, I, I didn't really have a lot of belongings. Like I had a chair and a bed, TV. And um, I had all my music equipment. What? You had a head of David? I had a head of David. Yes, I did. <laughs> so what I did was I had a big walk-in closet and I really didn't have a lot of belongings. So I used all the shelves in the closet to store all my music equipment. And when um, I first moved in there, I had no tables. I had nothing. I had a, a Tascam four track recorder. I had my guitar. I had a Digitech rack mount effects unit. And I had a Kwai PH50 keyboard that I inherited from John when he left. And I had an EV entry level EV microphone. I didn't even have a mic stand. <laughs> and I, I had an album. I had an album deal. Right. I had a couple dozens of maybe maybe 30, 40 songs between the stuff that I worked on with John and that I worked on Will that I couldn't use because I didn't have the drum machine patterns. I didn't have a drum machine. <laughs> um, I didn't know how to program a drum machine. I didn't have a bass. I just had my equipment. So I took the four track out. I grabbed my box of cassettes, master tapes, and I started listening to all these um, songs that I was initially demoing either to give, to bring in for me and John to work on and later me and Will to work on. And there were a lot of oddball songs that I didn't think we were gonna use because they were more ambient songs like um, November and Fate. Um, a song like The Realization, which I think I initially just had as sort of like a, a ambient or slow motion instrumental. And I yeah, just found all these tapes. wild to think that that song could have been lost. Yeah. So I, I think I just started going through these tapes and I also had found my original um, demos for Distant Eastern Glare and Ionia and Desert. And I thought, well, I'm just gonna have to go with the more minimal equipment that I used to demo these with mm. and just expand as much as I could on it. So I, I think in the next couple of weeks, I became sort of an expert at bouncing tracks and I don't know how I did it, but somehow a month later I had Ionia done and I still remember this really well because it progressed so fast from April and our missed deadline. And Sam, I remember when I called Sam up and had to tell him for not the first time, but for a second time, yeah, I'm changing directions again. Yeah. And now I'm going to go alone and do it alone. And now instead of it being like Byzantine XK, it's going to be slower ambient stuff. And I remember, I, he probably doesn't remember this, maybe he does, but I remember him telling me, maybe we shouldn't do a deal. And I thought, oh shit, I blew it. I really blew it. The reality of it is I didn't blow it. Right. I was last man standing. So I, I literally just would go to work, come home from work, I had my music equipment right where in the studio apartment where the dining room table would be. And I'm guessing that's where the dining room table would be because there was a hanging light above me. Right. I literally would sit on this floor. I had my four track, the keyboard, my guitar, and I had it in a circle around me. And I sat there every night until, you know, a couple hours until it was time to go back to work and I would record. And I, that, that's, you know, I only started a couple songs in that, in those sessions. And that was um, a brief glimpse in this moment. The rest of the songs were tapes that I had found that I was demoing and I just finished them. And it was so, the recording situation was so raw that when it came time to record my vocals, I had a folding chair. And I would be sitting on the floor and I'd bring the folding chair behind me and I and I put a this big thick blanket over top of me. 
that yeah. bear blanket. You, well, I still have it here. I still have it. And, Cassie, and it's a, it's a, uh, Cassie yeah. fixed that one Salvage up. Day. Yeah. So I would put that blanket over top of me because besides the, um, the woodworker that was always out there cutting wood on the porch in the middle of the night, I had a, a woman that lived downstairs that was in an uh, uh, abusive relationship. And so they would throw stuff at each other and scream. And then I had a person on the other side that for some reason, when he would hear that noise, decided to pound on my wall. <laughs> so I'm trying oh, to record Lord. the vocals for this album on a, a $70 microphone with a blanket hanging over top of me, standing as still as I could, because if every time the mic moved, you'd hear bump pops. Right, right, right. Yeah. All the vocals for Ionia was recorded that way. Um, That's hilarious. It, it was raw. So what you're saying is the cats meowing and the dog barking are just more continuation of the original <laughs> setup. Lycia has had an entire <laughs> recording career that I've never had a quiet place to record. Yeah. There's always distractions within. I, I don't think I've had longer than a five minute segment without a distraction. We had a decent one in Ohio. Yeah, except for the lady downstairs pounding on with the broom. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. That's true. So that's a funny story. I'll just interject real quick. When I was recording vocals for, I believe it was Polaris, and I had strep throat really, really bad, I finished my take, and the lady downstairs starts pounding on the ceiling with a broom, yelling, shut the hell up. <laughs> and... Dave Gala sent us um, the remnants of that session a couple of years ago, and you can hear the pounding. That is and then so we, we can't hear what she's saying, but we can hear the three of us talking. Like, I don't know if it was you or Dave said, what was that? And I was like, it's that lady downstairs. Leadfoot. We call her Leadfoot. Yeah, because despite the fact that... Um, she complained about our noise. I don't know how someone living below you, you could hear her every footstep. Yeah. We lived in that apartment for six years and I never once heard neighbors on either side of us. No, no. But for some reason, that woman that lived downstairs that complained about us being noisy, I heard every single yeah. footstep that she made in that house. Yeah. But so we called her left foot. Yeah. Once Dave moved out, though, you had the you had his bedroom as a studio. So that was the last time you really had sort of an official space. And that was 1996 and seven. And yeah, I but let's just go back. I would close the door. <laughs> and the whole time I'm recording, I would hear cats outside the door meowing because they wanted to come in with me. True. Yeah. yeah. And doing this on the. Yeah. Door. <laughs> exactly anyway back to ionia so but anyway um what ended up happening then is um we had that april deadline that we missed i spent um probably the middle of may to into june recording and i was in la mixing it with sam rosenthal on july early july it might have been it might have even been the fourth of july well that's funny i think i remember uh, telling me it was your birthday well, my birthday's the 5th of July, and thanks for just informing the entire world about that. But <laughs> I, I feel fairly confident we've posted about it before. So, all right. But, anyways, um, so project immediately sent, got sent it out to get mastered into the plant, and it was out in September. Well, I hadn't seen Will for a while and, and a couple months, and he shows up to my apartment in Mesa. And the gall. And he shows up and he comes in. He's like, I'm ready to start work on the album again. Well, la -di da And I literally handed him the CD of Ionia. Uh, and that, that was truly the beginning of the end of our friendship. We tried to, I um, really, I mean, I, of the end? I feel like the beginning of the end was when he was going to, it was already, novel. I mean, I <laughs> mean, when we were working, I, I gave him another shot. I, oh. I, liked, I, I liked some of the stuff yeah. that me and him collaborated on and we were and at times we were really good friends but when we were working yeah. on Start Corner 
Um, Cause initially Will was going to be part of um, some of right. the songs in Star Corner, but um, I went to LA and I mixed, mixed the, the album with Sam and I came back and Will just shows up one day and he told me that he didn't want to be on the album. And he was on two songs. And I said, the album's already mixed. And he told me that he didn't want to be associated with Lycia because <laughs> Lycia wasn't, wasn't the kind of music he liked. He was more into aggressive music like Godflesh. Now, I'm not going to really go beyond that, right, but right. there is some very bizarre ironies to all this as time has passed. And to take it even farther back in the when, a few years previous, he was very much into um, uh, nine, uh, 80s death metal, which was sort of strange that I worked with him because I came from this total post-punk right. background. And I had never worked with any metal people, but Will and I had a mutual love of Killing Joke, and that's what brought us together. Right. But um, he, he was really into sort of some extreme metal, and I find it strangely ironic that Ionia is being reissued by Avant Garde Music, which is a very famous black and doom metal label. Yeah, and hilarious. I and today, hilarious. and today, you know, you did some vocals for a band that is known in those, those genres. And I think a, what has really salvaged Lycia's career from being completely obscure in the early 2000s to be relevant, relevant again really was the different aspects of the metal scene, which really right. embraced us and brought us back. And I think there's a lot of strange ironies, irony that I, you know, back when I was working on Ionia and Start Corner, that I had to deal with criticism from people that were supposed to be in the band and my friends, Right. that I guess I just wasn't metal enough. Yeah. And I had no interest in being metal. And now the metal community has accepted us to the point where me and you talk about this a lot. It is the most healthy, open-minded scene that I've ever been associated with. I mean, we're, we've never really been associated with any scene, but I've never seen a scene as it is right now yeah. that is pulling in all these different styles. And the song that you worked on today with the, with the band, I'll let you talk about it in a bit. Yeah. I, as I told you today, this is way better than any shoegaze band I ever heard. And I was a massive shoegaze fan when that scene was relevant. And I'm thinking the shoegaze scene, at least the, the element of the shoegaze scene that I dealt with, there were some very friendly elements. Like we had a good relationship with Closed Down. We did some shows with Closed Down and we did um, a few other bands. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, of what, was that, what was that band from Seattle? Was it um, Bethany Curve? Bethany Curve, yeah. Bethany Curve and Clothes were two shoegaze bands that we really clicked with. But there were yeah. some other shoegaze bands that I knew that sort of had this opinion of Lycia of you're just this goofy goth band, but we are a real band. Right. We're, a, we're a true blue shoegaze band. I'm like, you're from Arizona and you're imitating bands from England. So get over your high horse there. But we had a real bad, exp I mean, probably some of those people still think they're my friend, but I remember things and I remember some of the snide remarks and the, and I remember them. Yeah. And, and I felt very insulted by people that I thought were my friends that basically said I was, that Lycia was has-beens and we weren't, we couldn't fill a club. And so don't let them headline because they're just not cool enough or not good enough. You know, hey, man, enjoy. And we're, we're still doing music and we're still pushing forward. We're not living off of some, you know, memory that's 25 years old. We, 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 we try to move forward. But yeah, you know, it's funny because, you know, the same thing sort of happened, you know, me as a younger person, you're, you're and this is really going far back, obviously, like when I was in school and stuff and the really cool kids in school. You know, it was like, you're a poser, you're a poser. And it's like, uh, all these years later, I'm the exact same person I was at age 16. And they're like, you'd never know they ever, 
even listen to a cool band once in their entire life. You know what I mean? I mean, I have some stories about that too. Right. And, but first, let's just finish up about the shoegaze thing, which yeah. is all these post-metal bands that are just doing, they're, they're out shoegazing shoegazers because they're adding this extra element of dynamics. Right. As opposed to just, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I love slow dive. Yeah, and I love I love bands like that, um, but there's a lot of shoegaze stuff that I think is just rubbish. Um, but a lot of these post metal, blah. like there's no oomph to it, you know. It's just this kind yeah. of samey samey yeah. sound, and then there's the bands that do it really well. That there's this next level. There is. You can definitely tell the next level bands. Yeah, for sure. Um, but when you hear the, the post metal bands doing their take on shoegaze, like the song you worked on today, it goes from just this beautiful, beautiful atmospherics and then it's heavy, but it's yeah. still atmospheric. Right. And the song, I guess the best way I can explain a lot of the post metal bands is they build material almost in symphonic ways without symphonic instruments. Right. When you think about Blero, it starts out quiet yeah, yeah, yeah. and it just, yeah. It just completely repeats the same pattern until it builds up to the point and it's just like shaking right. the rafters or, and I think a lot of um, post-metal bands build the dynamics in their songs like that, as opposed to just getting into a groove and going with it. They build it to a peak of a mountain yeah. and then it's intense. And I, I, I dig that a lot. I, I like it a lot, but. Don't you think, um Justin Broderick kind of started that whole thing with his well I, I I'm not really probably a good person because as you well know I was really a big time music fan I can talk about bands from the 60s and 70s yeah. and 80s yeah. and then when Lycia took off I became sort of a, a AWOL when it came to listening right. to new bands and stuff and then by the 2000s I literally became that old man that didn't know anything that was going on and Same. I dropped out and, and the, I think that it wasn't until we became involved again and we realized that there was a, a new dark wave scene that was cross pollinating with all these yeah. other scenes that we, that I, and I think to a certain degree, you, you also, that's when we became um, fans of uh, more, yeah. you know, a contemporary music and yeah. we became more aware of what was going on. Yeah. And I have to say it kind of started with Sarah um from black mirror because i remember you know we were friends with rich and he posted a link to her black mirror record and and it i was just like listen to this music it's it's like reminiscent of what we do but it's new and it's like metal and it you know but it had the same from heart to it you know the same vibe yeah. and then from there it's like you find this other stuff that's the same and you're just like this is the scene, you know, it's just so good. And maybe the people that were involved in the scene look at that scene in the same way that we used to feel jaded in the 90s dark wave scene of like, yeah, you know, we're tired of being this. But for us being away and coming back and suddenly right. seeing all these bands that were sort of doing, at least approaching music away the way we were approaching music in the it. 90s, yeah. you know, Angle. you remember well in the in the mid 90s when we would tour um after dave decided he didn't want to tour anymore me and you would go out by yourself it would just be me you my guitar the keyboard and and our rhythms and other electronics on the dat tape right and we would show up after club after club after club and the, the clubs, the sound people, everybody was totally confused by what we were doing because yeah. it, it, was, it, it, it was completely oddball at the time because back then bands showed up with their drums and their bass and their amps and yeah. their, their roadies and their track boxes. And here we sh showed up basically with our studio and I submixed on stage and I would literally hand the sound man to XLR outs, and then he would proceed to tell me 
I don't have any more direct boxes. And I would say, see these two things here? These are adapters I bought for $12 at Radio Shacks, quarter inch to XLR. You can, you can plug those directly in your snake. And he would look at me and say, oh shit, this guy actually knows sound. <laughs> and then I would say, just try to maintain the sound the best you can. Of course, they would consistently screw it up. They had no idea. Uh, I, I was running um, pitch on my guitar, um, a Lexicon LXP5 pitch, uh, pitched reverb, beautiful reverb. And the sound guy would hear that pitched reverb on my guitar and he would spend the entire night trying to mix the feedback out of my vocals, which would one, cause more feedback and two, make the vocals where you couldn't even hear it. And it was, wasn't even the vocals, it was the guitar. He, and uh, we we didn't we couldn't afford a sound guy at the time. Really, I mean, we think that your guitar was the synth a lot of times too. I would say turn the guitar up and nothing would be turned up. Yeah. Uh, but so you know we don't need to go into the '90s tour horror stories. But when we were doing it, nobody understood what we were doing when we were on the road. At least as we toured our several tours across the country, there was we every night. You remember the sound guy would be. I'm top notch. I'm the best sound guy in town. I'll get you great sound. And then after the show, it's like, I don't understand what happened. I don't, I, I don't know why there was so much feedback. Yeah. And to the point where we actually had that cartoon on our refrigerator in Ohio. You remember that one? Vaguely. Where the sound guy was there and he was like, more feedback. Yeah. And he yeah, was yeah. turning the feedback button up. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it was such a common occurrence that. I mean, that was the whole reason why you stopped singing. The, yeah. The, the whole reason why you stopped singing was because of the uncontrollable feedback. But the point was that we, we were struggling to play live because no one could understand our sound. And I, even when we talked with sound guys that were, I guess, goth rock sound guys, they seemed like completely confused by what we were doing. We were, we were just these, we were coming from this angle that, at that time frame was very bizarre. Yeah. And at least in the United States. Now it's common. So when we came back around, we'd go out and see bands play. And I still, you know, I'm, we're watching Soft Kill play and there's like a, a wall of reverb and I'm looking at the sound guy walking and he has a, he has a tablet mixer and he probably has all this top line feedback repression. That wasn't the way it was back then. It was like, their idea of feedback repression was, let's turn the reverb off and sing louder. <laughs> and as you well remember, my numerous arguments with sound guys where they're telling me to sing louder and I'm on the stage telling them that he's basically a piece of shit and we're the ones touring and you're the one working for us. Of course, then he finds that feedback button and really cranks it up. But um, yeah, and, and honestly, I don't remember you ever saying that. I think we had no Jacksonville, heard. Jacksonville, Florida. I got into it with the sound guy. I it, that evening all around, with the exception of the band that opened for us, that was very cool. But everything else, I never want to go to Jacksonville again because from the beginning of the Florida, I, guess. I mean, the way the evening ended was that the club stiffed us. They told us to go down to another club where the owner was down drinking. Right. He told us to fuck off. And on top of that, some Haitian homeless guy comes up to me, asked me for some money. So to get him out of, you know, just to move him along, I gave him a couple of dollars. And as we were loading our equipment, we see like 10 Haitian guys walking down the street to our car to come get money from us. Yeah, that was and then the, the bouncer at the club just looks at us and laughs, thinks it's funny. Well, do you remember that? Um, I think that was the show that Pat Ogle actually threatened to come down there and have, his, have that guy's leg broke. Do you remember? Well, that? let me tell you what happened here. We actually had a professional booking agent, Bay Ridge yeah. Booking, who we, we, we hooked up with them um, via two connections. One was um, Typo Negative. We had toured with Typo Negative previously and their manager, Ken Creedy, that 
at the time when we toured one, their manager was Ken Creedy, and he's the guy that had Bay Ridge booking. The other connection we had is that we um, played um, in New York City with um, the promoter. I forgot his last. I think it's Neville Wells. Is that what his name? And then he had an assistant, Ben DeWalt. Yeah. And Ben DeWalt Walt went to work for Bay Ridge. To concentrate on um, dark wave music, so he did us and Switchblade Symphony and some other bands, and we were in really good standing with um, Bay Ridge. And so when they found out that we they got um, that they stiffed us, Bay Ridge took all the concerts that they had booked at that club, which included Switchblade Symphony and some industrial bands yeah. that were going to be really good high attended things. So, um, but nevertheless, back to the argument with the sound guy. That's what's that. They might have, but what ended up happening, and you probably don't remember because you were probably out trying trying to find dinner for us because they stiffed us on that too. Yeah. But um, we were on stage and the guy kept on saying, I'm not putting reverb, you'll get feedback, just sing louder. And I had just had it. And I, that's when I said, look, we got records out, we're on tour. It's not for you to tell me what we should sound like. It's for you just to do what I'm telling you. Of course, you did he listen? No, no, we probably were flooded with feedback that night. Yeah, that was a weird, that was a weird night because first of all, they got our name wrong. They called us Lycia Gold. No, that was in South Carolina. I thought that they had the flyers wrong there too. No, they had yeah. really beautiful flyers. That's what it was. They had really beautiful flyers. But no, anyway. and the reason was is because the opening band, who I really feel bad about because we were cussing, we were, we were angry at everybody, and they were just like, oh, we're sorry. You know, they tried, and they were a, a cool. Go ahead. I think they were a shoegaze style band, too, on top of that. They yeah, were some cool people. Weird. Yeah, that was weird. And then, but nobody showed up really to that show. But I remember these two girls, and they were the cutest freaking girls ever they looked like twins they weren't twins but they they were just these two cute little neat quiet sweet girls had come to see us and they always stuck in my mind and they were actually the inspiration for two of my characters in my book but that's those are the things i remember and i remember us walking around trying to find some place to eat and the whole place was just closed. There was nothing open anywhere, anywhere yeah. around there. Everything was just closed. So we just went back and didn't eat. At that day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was crazy. And then the whole thing with the, I feel like those guys were like threatening to do voodoo on us too, or something. Like there Well, was they were threatening to, to mug me. I know that for sure. <laughs> Like I was just like, get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. We're going. That was crazy. Yeah. It almost looked like the, you know, walking dead. You see them, yeah, these group of guys crazy. walking down the street from, you know, the swamps of Jacksonville coming to like steal money from us. And yeah, it was weird. That was definitely weird. Yeah. Anyway, that was an odd tangent. But, but yeah. the point was, you didn't get like that with people, generally speaking. It was always. No, I rumbling to ourselves like oh this sucks. i'm general i as i've often said to people in my life especially in the different jobs i've had i should just go to the tattoo parlor right now and get the word chump tattooed on my forehead because then at least i mean i've been you know i i i'm, I'm i always want everyone else to be happy and so I generally will take one for the team but unfortunately when like in the band I tend to accidentally screw over the band too you know um, but anyways, yeah, you're right. Let's let's get back to yeah, let's get back the other to subject. So, so Iona came out, and now I'll I'll add my uh, two cents on Iona, which I've told this story a whole bunch of times. But you know, um, I know that you have issues with that album, you know, for things that you've already discussed, and plus, you know, mixing issues and stuff like that. But for me, I mean, that album literally changed my life. You know, uh, my friend Matt, who I was pen pals with, sent me a copy of it. 
I'm writing him back and casually popped the tape in. He sent another tape. I listened to probably 25 seconds of it, took it out, put it aside, popped Ionia in, and I'm writing him back. And as soon as the music kicked in, I stopped and I was like, oh my God. And then I start writing again. And then your voice kicked in and I was just like, like, I have to know this person. And I wrote my friend back and I'm like, who is this? Is this Carl McCoy's side project? Because I thought your voice sounded like Carl McCoy from Guilt for Nephilim. And, uh, and uh, who is this? Do you have an address? Blah, 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 blah. So I send my letter off and however long it takes for him to write back. He's like, no, this is not Carl McCoy. This is Lycia. And here's, I don't have his address. So he obviously had a dub copy probably too. And he's like, uh, here's the record label's address though. So I wrote to Sam. Well, I wrote the project record. Probably some totally cheesy, stupid email you know, uh, letter. And lo and behold, Sam writes me back, and I remember him saying, "The fact that you don't have Mike Van Portfleet's address tells me that you have a dub copy of this cassette. But here's his address anyway." <laughs> so, in typical Sam fashion, he scolded me. And I, um, so I wrote to you and, but the funny thing is, is, you know, at the time I was in my band with, um, two, two friends and, um, we were recording songs and, and stuff like that. And I remember calling band meetings and being like, we're listening to this as a team and this is what we should be doing, you know, like forcing it upon them. <laughs> well, you need to get, you need to get your, um your folding chair and your blanket and hold the mic real still. Well, our recording situation wasn't that vastly different from that when we recorded at home, but um, yeah, I don't know. It, it just, um, I mean, I think now about how funny that is uh, that once again, I had the audacity to like hunt somebody down <laughs> and that you wrote me back. And then now there's an actual whole human being that's alive because of Ionia. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can uh, be uh, critical of it or whatever, but it changed my life, your life, Dirk's life, and whoever comes after him. So, well, let, let me explain that because do I think Ionia is a bad rec record? No. Do I think it's a bad mix? No. My problem is this, is that when I visualize something a certain way, if it doesn't end up being what I visualized, it could still be good, right. but because it's not what I thought it was, my natural insecurities tells me, right. like a, it's like a light switch, you failed. Right. And, you know, I didn't have at that point in my life the, the knowledge or the ability to really fully carry out my visions. Right, of course. I mean, you see how it's been the last decade here in the house and how I have recording techniques and I know how to capture my ideas. If I go in and I know what I want, I know how to get it. But then, um, no, uh, you know, I was only a few years into multi-tracking and I'm wheeling and dealing and I'm sort of reinventing Lycia sound at the time because, you know, you listen to Wake. That, that was what I did in the 80s. John Fair and I worked on and off through the 80s. And that is what we did. Guitar, bass, drums, vocals. Occasionally the drums are gone. We had drum machine instead. So Wake to me is really, I mean, they're, they're, if I would have botched the I you know doing Ionia and we I would have actually lost the deal that would have been the end of the line and so I'd be sitting here thinking about my music career now which was would have been a real struggle in the 80s sort of swimming upstream that culminated in wake because right. that's what the decade of the 80s was for me and then literally from probably starting in maybe late 89 up until 
early 91, a two-year period, I went from that to moving into, you know, because John started morphing the way he was writing before he left, and we started incorporating synth and moving in maybe almost a more uh, pop direction as people will become a little bit more aware of that um, this summer, but because um, John and I, for the new EP, are redoing a couple of songs from that era, the, 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 the electronic era. But anyways, you know, I went from this guitar based stuff and maybe a little bit even dirty, you know, messy sounding like if you listen to the Lycia early demos it's distortion and the echoes and the distortion are just bouncing all over the place and you can hear pick scrapes as part of the, the way we played them you you know suddenly you move from that and we're doing more synth oriented stuff and then we start doing this more clean guitar stuff and then John leaves and then me and Will are doing this slow motion almost you know slow most slow motion noise industrial stuff and then I'm reinventing another sound and I'm now I'm suddenly doing, you know, ambient sense and slow motion guitar. And it just, it was all so quick, but I still had in my mind this sound. And when I went into the mix of Ionia, I, I, I couldn't, I don't think I could have done it myself and I couldn't even explain it to Sam. And so Sam, you know, I'm probably standing behind Sam like, ah, I don't know, I, I make it, you know, yeah. and yeah, I personally think he did a great job on the mix. But my problem is, is that it doesn't match, doesn't mesh with my vision right. of what that album was going to be. And that, that's always my struggle. Um, sometimes when I step back and I don't listen to, to anything for a real long time, I'll be like, oh my God, that what, like I just told you yesterday about Empty Space. Went and listened to a couple songs up to Empty Space and I was like, you know, that album isn't as horrible and suck, sucks as bad as I thought, you know? Because I you remove yourself because I, re yeah, you remember with a lot of things, like I have a lot of weird vibes towards Day in the Stark Corner because, of, you know, the state of, mind I was at the time when I recorded it you know no one wants to go look finally back oh yeah I remember the good old days where I was so depressed I didn't leave my house that those were the days weren't they yeah yeah, yeah it's just interesting to think how like if John hadn't left what that first album would have been and then if you know it, or or if Will had cooperated what that album could have been. I mean, obviously, you know, I believe everything happens for a reason, good and bad. It is what it is kind of thing. This is what how it was meant to work out. But you wonder, like, what the alternate direction, one way or the other, could have been and how it would have affected the ongoing career, you know? Uh, it, it's hard to say. wouldn't have been there if John had stayed or if Will had stayed. So, you know. Yeah. Well, and on top of that, your your volume is really cutting out. Is it back now? And it's really quiet. I don't know if the microphone needs to be plugged back in or something. No, nothing happened. Is it any better? I turned it off. No, it's you're really quiet compared to what you you were, but back to that whole thing the, the other irony is that um what i ended up doing on the third take on that album really was the most appropriate fit for a project because your volume is 100 percent gone now 